cavalrymen and infantrymen. The cavalry are more to the front, based on the direction they are looking in. The shields are more ovular than round. They're small, of course, but that's probably just to show the Romans a little bit more. They're probably pretty large shields. And they're ovular more so than they are uh, circular, but probably because this is not so standardized. The Roman military equipment was not that standardized in this period. Um, so it's they have flower-esque designs on it with bosses in the center, helms, capes, lorica, possibly scale, which would be called squamata in Latin. But also, as it becomes evident later on, and even in early periods, a lorica of platelets gives a more solid structure to the torso, and effectively heats up in hotter weather, thus the term clebania was used in Latin, which means oven, and it became a very common description of later Byzantine lamellar torso armor, which would then be transcribed into Greek as clevanium, you know, so spelt K-L-I-V-A-N-I-O-N, yes, that's what it is. So, I have a whole theory about the term of Clebanati in these earlier periods compared to Cataphractati, which is something I'll get into when I get around to making a video on the Equite Sagittari Clebanati, but it's a topic for another time because I can't be a Roman military archery channel and not talk about them at some point. So, now, contextually, I have to make one thing clear. Uh, while art can and often does draw from reality, it's injected with a hefty amount of conceptualization as I have come to learn from studying the history of Western art in college. One may think that this negates drawing any conclusions of reality, but it's a rather short-sighted look at art and history. It's actually the opposite. Because it's conceptualized, it reveals aspects of culture and society, virtues, and generally broad ideas of thinking that we can actually extract more understanding from it, communicated in a way that realism can't. So, in context, what is being purveyed? Well, martial values, mostly. Uh, based on the direction they're facing in toward the left, that is, this would put the cavalrymen in front of the infantrymen. We know that when comparing it to the established history of this period, cavalry had taken on a predominantly important role, being often more decisive due to their higher mobility, which gave them an edge over infantry-oriented peoples like the Goths, uh, as we do see. The infantrymen being behind uh, may rather symbolize a more passive, less mobile, more defensive role. This isn't to say they aren't important or they are ineffective like some people like to think they are. They're just not tactically and strategically as decisive by themselves. They're slow moving, retaining the rigidity of their formation and deploying in a defendable position uh, as we see in some battles of this period. Uh, where they can support the cavalry, and this is the basis of Roman Byzantine tactics going forward for the next couple of centuries. It's a mixed battle formation of a less mobile infantry force that supports a more mobile cavalry force, and these were developments that can be traced to the Emperor Gallienus' reforms in the 3rd century, uh, when there was a significantly increased reliance on homegrown cavalry, partly due to the Caracalla reforms, uh, primarily eliminating the distinction between auxiliary and legionary, so more or less the identity of someone being a Roman spread, for the most part. Now, we can also say that there is nothing particularly foreign here, based on how the soldiers are portrayed. In artwork, how to symbolize a Roman was often by portraying them in nostalgically Roman garb, often with shoes that appear similar to extended sandals, such as here, but most importantly, the bare legs, noted by the detail put into their muscularity, while barbarians were shown in trousers. In reality, this wasn't what it was exactly, as it was due to a very long and complicated history that deserves someone else to describe in greater detail, link in the description. But in short, Roman cultural conceptions of masculinity wasn't dependent on warrior virtues, but on self-control and intellectual endeavors. Thus, one of the reasons why the legions of late antiquity started to resemble Germanic practices as we perceive them, of course, was because of the separation of civic masculinity and the martial culture. In the military, they adopted what the Romans perceived as characteristics of barbarian customs to further emphasize this separation, 
but these were more stereotypes of Germanic culture and were a Roman construct of it regardless of whether or not it was actually realistic or if there were Germans enlisting in the military. And this also extends to aspects of Iranian cultures and other steppe cultures as well because, again, they're all barbarians. Uh, and so it's more that they are resembling stereotypes of what Romans thought of them. So it was a way of further emphasizing the separation between masculine civility culture and the martial culture. This was sort of represented in art, particularly in the portrayal of weapons and tactics, and in some instances also in clothing, but it was always to give or take depending on the intentions of the artist. Some were intent on portraying martial culture holistically, hence we see Roman martial culture portrayed anachronistically on ancient literature along with trends in the use of weapons and tactics. One such example being the general rise in artistic portrayals of horse archery by conceptualized Romans in art from the 5th century Ambrosian Iliad, among others, where in the original Iliad of Homer there was no mention of it. Here, of course, just like in the ivory relief of Eustinian World Conqueror, it follows very much the same concept, the garb invokes the nostalgic image of Romanness from a more mythologized time period and is communicating Roman virtues as a universal thing uh, in their time period. So, speaking of horse archery, the elephant in the room I'm getting to is the man in the center. Horse archery among the Romans in this time period wasn't just some barbarian or foederate concept, though foederates were mentioned extensively in the established histories of this period. The Roman military was always reactive and changing, so the archery culture that existed in the eastern portions of the empire more or less spread and strengthened due to a number of factors that included responding to external threats and internal problems dealing with numbers, just as well as the concept of adopting Roman constructs of stereotyped barbarian culture, quote unquote, to further emphasize the martial separation from the civic, the bow became principally used in the 6th century as an evolution of emerging Roman practices since the Diocletian reforms. It's important to mention that since the barbarization was a deliberately socially constructed thing, the Romans of the military adopting such things knew this, and for this reason didn't see themselves as any less Roman, just they are partake partaking in the martial subculture. And that makes this image interesting and how well it compares with the established histories depicting the Roman attitude towards archery in this period as being very much a Roman virtue. Just as it is here, a Roman cavalry archer is clearly communicated as idealistically Roman. In fact, by the Strategicon's writing, archery was more associated with Romans than it was with foreigners, as I've stated in previous videos of mine. It is also definitely a Eustinianic era depiction, not only because of the similar motifs with the World Conqueror relief, but because of the lack of stirrups on the horsemen. When stirrups are then introduced into the military, it accordingly explodes in instances of their artistic portrayals almost immediately. This was only during Maurice's era and is not emblematic of the early or middle 6th century. As for the bow itself, it can be construed as what the Romans would call a Scythian bow. This doesn't mean what you think it means, though. This is cultural terminology that is communicated to us from the 4th century historian Ammianus Marcellinus, in which two separate instances he applies the Scythian bow term to describe its shape, specifically the grip, as being like the waning moon, quote-unquote. This doesn't so much refer to its actual origin or any other specifics of its design and construction. It is almost exclusively applied as a term meant to denote the design of the grip of a certain bow, which can be amalgamated as meaning a composite bow, given those kinds of bows are the only ones that can create such a shape. But to reiterate, in the Roman concept conceptualization, a Scythian design just means a bow with a waning grip. Uh, the reason why would have to do have to be due to its sharing the common characteristic with historical near steps Iranian bows going back to the classical period wielded by the Iranic tribes of the Scythians, which we see in their artwork, of course. Marcellinus, however, doesn't just describe this as exclusive to the Scythians, but also was a bow of the Parthians as well, and based on the Sassanid artwork, it is communicated that the Scythian shape was used by the contemporary Sassanids as an inheritance from the early earlier Parthian dynasty. While he describes all other nations uh, having a single curve to their bow, be it a self or a composite bow.
Another note is that it seems that the tips of the bow are straight. Uh, if that was done on a particular purpose, I don't know. It's still interesting to note how Verin could be, but doesn't necessarily establish the use of a bow with horn seas. Though, other instances of bows portrayed in artwork also depict forward recurved tips, implying the flexibility goes all the way through to the tips and not just in the center limbs. But of course, you could also have seas that are curved, but they're just more solid and they don't bend. And that's kind of the whole point of seas is that they're a very solid thing that gives a little bit of integrity to uh, the more vulnerable portions of the structure. The lack of archaeology makes concluding anything frustrating, but if you want my opinion, there probably wasn't one single standard design of bow anyways, and Romans probably used all kinds. I use the equipment passage of the Strategicon to argue this, since it just refers to equipping cavalry with bows suited to the strength of each man, not necessarily indicating a certain design like Scythian or Avar or Hunnic terms that they apply to other things in the rest of the text, some, sometimes denoting equipment or other such, th other such things, but to bows, it's just not applied here. It's just, they say to use bows that are suited to their strength. And we can probably assume that also to the size and the proportions of each man as well. But again, this will require its own, its own video, but as a disclaimer, I have a rather different opinion on what most Roman army blogs talk about, usually because they often just gloss over the topic and typically just repeat what other people tell them, uh, usually concepts that are left over from the barbarization thesis, a hypothesis that since the 1990s historians take less seriously. So, one, cavalry, one cavalryman doesn't wear a helmet, but the archer does. What is the meaning of this? Again, more than anything, this getup is communicating that the archer is a Roman, while the unhelmeted individual may be communicating a more important person, but it could also be construed that if the person in front was more important, then he would have had a more distinct helmet, which is a common characteristic, uh, or sorry, a common artistic motif, especially in this time period. One such example being the Ambrosian Iliad in the last century. Um, however, upon further examination, the unhelmeted individual appears to be wearing a head wreath, which is a common nostalgic Roman concept denoting the Augustus on many coins, which would then line up with the motifs of all the other Romans, which is there to communicate a conceptualized, you know, an archetypal Roman, right? Now, back to the archer, he wears a helmet, of course, which some people uh, whom have interpreted the Ipotoxotai of this time period as seemingly not wearing a helmet, uh, but like everything, this needs more context. The Strategicon more or less describes an archer with a helmet, all right, even requiring it. Uh, according to their pay as professionals, soldiers in the regular Roman army use their wages to equip themselves, so their armament, while somewhat having a minimum threshold of what is acceptable, is still mainly up to them, uh, and probably also up to the unit that they're training in, whatever their officer uh, requires of them. This is sort of a practice that goes back to the uh, Diocletian reforms as well. Uh, so something along those lines where a, a military unit has a minimum threshold, and that's how you identify them. But nonetheless, uh, Roman horse archers could have helmets, and we do know this. Uh, or some would not have helmets, depending on the preference, right? Depending on what they're trying to do. Within any individual togma, if this is an accurate description of a basic military unit during the Justinianic era, like it is in the Marikian era, they were made up of both lancers and archers. So it wasn't just a whole unit of archers and a whole unit of lancers. They were combined together in one single formation, one single togma. So you had archers and lancers put together. Often, simultaneously, an archer was a lancer. Uh, so, particularly the lancers being at the front to use their shields to protect themselves and the formation easier, while archers were formed to the center and rear. Just like in the infantry formations, the cavalry archers that didn't have a helmet would have been formed in the very center ranks behind the lancers, the archers with helmets, and a few ranks in front of the rear guards. For personal protection, they could use uh, then a worn buckler slung about the shoulder with support of a guise around the neck as to supplement facial protection like what Procopius described, and would have also potentially carried a spear about the shoulder, well, often they, they did, in the same manner as described in the later Strategicon, but due to how far in the cavalry formation they are, if the particularly cavalry togma or bandon, as it was sometimes called, 
were to engage in melee, the more optimally armed men in front would bear almost most of the burden, while the less armored men in the center would fight stragglers. It is also best to note that in this particular belief, the archer, very much like how it is described in the Strategicon, is formed behind other cavalrymen. Relatively, he would be considered an epistati in rank to the protostati in front. It is also best to note here, since I'm on the topic, that the Strategicon instructs tactics involving the assignment of roles in open battle, namely assault troops and defenders of a cavalry formation. It is said that it is optimal for a third of each meros to be in the role of assault troops termed corsoris, which were preferably archers. The reason this is, is because of the role of assault troops being more optimized for emergent skirmishing tactics. Upon the retreat of an enemy force, the Corsores breaks off from the whole formation and falls upon them, using their ranged ability to better reach their enemy, but more importantly, if the Corsores have to withdraw back, if they are being chased, they can withdraw to the lines and, of course, using their ranged abilities, can shoot off behind them to cover their retreat back to the main line, or they would form back up behind the Defensores, who retain their formational integrity. Alternatively, and possibly more common than the previous tactic, Corsores being skirmishers can break from the whole formation and engage with an enemy in a skirmish. If they did this, this would accord to the tactic of what later Byzantine military texts dubbed Procosatores, which is just the Corsores with the additional title of Pro, mean, in Greek meaning first attackers, so the assignments of Corsores function similar to the initiating skirmishes of the Procosatores, and we have rec record of this in the 6th century histories obviously Procopius. So he describes at the Battle of Callinicum that Roman archers, based on how they act in this situation, are more logically ones geared on horseback with a mixed formation of cavalry, cavalry meros next to infantry meros. Quote, For arrows shot from either side in very great numbers caused great loss of life in both armies, while some placed themselves in the interval between the armies and made a display of valorous deeds against each other. Unquote. Of course, the best chance in a scenario of engaging in the intervals is in a more mobile form on horseback, of course. It makes very little sense for infantry to break off like this unless it was light infantry, which would still make no sense given they are still heavily exposed. It would make more logical sense that this is, involves the kind of archer that Procopius described earlier in the book, uh, armored with lorica and greaves, and it shows in this passage, quote, their missiles hitting a corselet, perhaps, or helmet of a sh or shield of a Roman warrior were broken off and had no power to hurt the man who was hit." Unquote. Procopius could very well be describing the initiating skirmishes of Corsores on the Persian lines, while the Persians also responded with skirmishers of their own. The higher mobility of their horses and their armor protected the Roman Corsores enough while in the interval, and if I was to guess anything, they would quickly attack with arrow volleys, then subsequently retreat back to the main line back behind the Defensores, supported by the Meroses of, of infantry beside them. But I digress. This piece of artwork is an interesting one and does hold many statements to the culture of the Romans of this time period. I'll have other videos soon, thank you.